thank you, Lord Jesus, that you meet us in the land that we are living in. No matter what the land looks like, no matter, no matter if the land is dry or desolate or cracked or barren, Lord, you meet us there. And you teach us how to make good soil of it again.
You're a product of His faithfulness. Yeah, praise His name. If you're a product of intercession, praise His name. Yeah. If you're living proof that He is faithful through generations, praise His name.
with them. He is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. No matter what is going on in and around your life that you think is important, Jesus is still king. And he is your defender. Wow. He is your defender. Thank you, Jesus.
this morning in prayer, this, the scripture and the story kept coming to me about Paul. And when they were in the ship, and when they had the violent wind and the storms that came, and when they were in the ship, they couldn't face the wind. And it says, we, give way, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along in the midst of the storm. But then they went into a shelter in an island called Claudia. And there the ship's boat came back under control. But then they had it hoisted up. And they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship. And fearing that they might run aground, then they let down the anchor and let themselves be driven along. And the Lord was just, just highlighting how he is our firm foundation as we sang right this morning. And how grateful we are, how he has kept us and he's put us back together in the midst of the storms and the trials and the tribulations. And regardless of what everyone in this room has gone through, you are here today and you are still seeking the one whom has held you and protected you and kept you during the storms of life. And this morning he is here and he is binding us up and he is binded at us where in the midst of the storms and he's holstering us up and he is the anchor right now that we're holding on to and so lord i just want to thank you right now that all our eyes are set upon you for being our firm foundation and lord regardless of where we are and regardless of what's going on all around you are sustaining us you are keeping us together because it was out of your mouth that you spoke and lord we were created it was because of your holy word you are the holy word that lord you let us be here in such a time is this for your kingdom purposes so God as we turn everything of ourselves unto you with gratitude and thankfulness Lord remembering how you've picked up our pieces and put us back together and Lord you're still putting pieces back together even now and we're reminded Lord that we lean not on our own understanding but our faith hope and trust is in you and we are so grateful and Lord may we be a testimony Lord to others around of how good you are and how you keep us because you are a keeping God you are the one that doesn't change but Lord those storms and those seas they bow at your name they have no power over you you are God of all and as you go down and you read and Paul is telling the people to take courage and you know that's an active word and I feel that that's a word for us today it's not just an encouragement take courage it means take it it means grab it it's don't just sit and look at courage but take it take hold of it and let him be your strength let him be that anchor in Jesus' name. Did you two have anything, Roger or Charlotte? Did y'all have something? Yeah, I thought Charlotte might. I felt something over here before we shift. I'm thinking maybe I haven't even been watching, really watching what these ladies are doing with the banners and everything. But it, it so came alive to me this morning as I was watching them. As Lori stood in back of her, and she didn't have her really colored things. You know, she was not, she was just like this. And Lori just, she just came up and put her arms over her with that, um, whatever it was she had. <laughs> and she just stood there and did that. And then lo and behold, the next time I looked back, the one who had been in this place was worshiping. And I could, and, and she had those color, there was color. There was color in the things that she was, that she was worshiping with. But this was the neat part, was that Lori didn't leave. She just kept going around her and worshiping around her. And that's what the Father does for us. Even when we have no color, even when we have no place that it, we don't feel we're, we just feel rejected or we're not in the place we need to be. Remember that the Father is always coming around you. 
He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And I want to say this. Your color is coming back. Your color is coming back in the name of Jesus. Because we as a body of believers, we will support each other. This morning, the Lord had me walk over and just introduce myself to people. It's so easy to come in here and there's a group over here and one over here. It's so easy to just stay on your side. And then service is over and everybody goes out the doors. And I mean, I learned some things about people this morning. And it has, it has enlarged my life. And I'm saying that's what Lori was doing. She wasn't walking away. And let's say she was just an ordinary person like us. But she didn't walk away from her. She kept surrounding her. Even as she was worshiping and the colors were coming forth, she didn't negate her responsibility to be a family together. Amen. Amen. Feels like a real strengthening today. Where the Lord is just, you know, this is part of family, right? And it's ecclesia, but it's family. Where we're here, where we encourage one another. And we want to pray into that. And um, the scripture that I had was, um, did you want to share something for him? It was this, Psalms 27. Wait on the Lord and be strong. And let your heart take, let it take courage and wait for the Lord. Lord, this morning... We just come so grateful, so thankful. All our eyes are fixed upon you, Jesus. Lord, and even when they're not fixed upon you and we've seen one another, we're strengthened and encouraged, God, by those that we've seen walk through the fire and go through the storms, and yet you have been their firm foundation. Lord, it's the testimony, Lord, today. We testify of your goodness and your faithfulness. You are the great I am who never leaves and never forsakes regardless of what's happening in the atmosphere but God we come up higher today as we lighten up and we come up higher and we receive your perspective in the heart of the matter for our lives but for one another and even what you're saying God in our city and our nation God right now we're saying our trust is in you and you are the foundation of our city and you are the foundation of our families and you are the family uh, the foundation of our nation. It is you, God, that may our houses be built and may the nations be built for you are the king of kings and there is no other, no other but you. And we just thank you today for your sustaining love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We welcome y'all this morning. Hey, we're glad you're here this morning. We're going to transition now. Wasn't worship awesome? If you didn't participate in worship, it wasn't as good as it could have been. You've got to get engaged. You've got to sing. You've got to move. Right? Don't, 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 let the little ones, don't let the little ones that are coming around, don't, don't, don't let them intimidate you. They're just doing what you should have been doing for the last, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Anyways... Thank you so much, worship team. We, we enjoy uh, participating with you in worship. We're glad you're here this morning. If you are a guest, would you do me a favor and raise your hand? If you're a guest this morning, we don't have one guest. Oh, there, there we go. There's one. There's some here, some over here. If you, if you come here often, I'm not saying a member, but if you come here often, Introduce yourself to some of these people that raised their hand, please. We are so glad they're here with us. We're so glad you're here visiting with us this morning. And uh, hope you uh, feel at home and hope you come back. So this morning, um, Pastor Tim and Susan and Isaac Paul and John and Scott are still uh, in Japan. And... Um, They'll be coming back this week, but uh, keep them in your prayers uh, for safe travels back, and uh, 
pray for them. Let's pray for them right now. Father, I just pray over Pastor Tim, Susan, Isaac, Paul, John, and Scott. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that your word, your truth comes forth, that it comes uh, from the bottoms of their souls, God, that, that you just send your word to those around them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that... Um, that they have safe travels coming back home. Lord, I pray that uh, the turbulence is minimal, the time is short, and they have good rest on the way back. And, Lord, as they come back, Lord, I, I pray that they feel welcomed back into this land, welcomed back into this city. And, Father, I just pray blessings on them, blessings on their trip, and all those who they touch. In Jesus' name, amen. We're glad you're here this morning. We've got some announcements this morning, so if guys, if you'll play the announcements. Hey, dude, do you know where John East is? We were supposed to start filming with him like two hours ago. What? What's so special about the New Orleans docks? Like, we just need to find John East, because, like, he's... He's the star of the show. Where am I? Where am I? Oh no. Nagasaki? Not again. This always happens when I take naps at the New Orleans docks. Man. These are all my friend. I, I my friends here. I, I don't have a name for all of them, but the, I guarantee you they're all sausage related. Here's <laughs> this one. I like to call him sausage, and that one I like to call backstrap. I like to call him beef jerky, uh, and your your cheeseburger right there. See what I'm doing is practicing my prophetic gift by naming these deer after their destiny. And if you want a prophecy about your destiny, you could come to our Prophetic Flex, March 28th at 6.30 p.m. It's all online, so you have to register. Spots are limited. Do you like books? The CCS Bookstore Book of the Month, Revelation to Restoration by Dina Elliott, is a devotional type book that will take you on a journey to restoration. Be sure to get your copy in the CCS bookstore, only available there, not in stores like these. Well, hello everyone, I'm in Chinatown right now with the ethnic music blaring. I was contemplating what other words start with the letter C. Uh, coffee, uh, Christian Center, and Columbia. Some of the people from Christian Center are going to Columbia and they need your help to raise funds. So on March 30th at 8 a.m., we will be having a lot market for the people to sell various goods. Overflow Coffee will be open as well. Tell your friends and come to help send our people to Columbia. Isn't that adorable? Speaking of adoration, on April 4th, we will be having an adoration night, which is a night away from all the busyness and cameras, where we can come together and adore the Father. Ladies, do you like flowers? Do you like spring? Do you like conferences? Well, boy, do I have the thing for you. April 11th to the 13th, Bloom Women's Conference. I don't have any roses here, but we have Rose Sandbrook who will be the main guest speaker. Be sure to register on the app as soon as possible.
I can do it. I can do it. Are you sad? Do you get frustrated? Do you have sudden fits of rage? Boy, do I have a thing for you. April 8th, we will be having a deliverance night with a special guest speaker from Oregon, followed by our cleansing fire teams that will pray for you for healing and deliverance. Well, everyone, I think that's it. If you want to stay connected, grab a bulletin or download our CCS app. I'm John East. This has been Almost Live. And I need to find your way home because my boat left without me. Okay. So, John East, John East said April 8th, but it's actually April 10th. It was up there. No, that's okay. I, I was just making the correction. So April 10th is when our guest speaker is going to be here. Sherry, where are you? There you are. Come up here and talk a moment about Bloom. Good morning, ladies. How's everybody doing? I just wanted to remind you that today is the deadline, the 24th, for a T-shirt. So how many of you have already registered for Bloom? Yay! How many of you in here have never been to Bloom? Never been to a Bloom? Ah! Maybe ladies that have been can look around and see those hands and, and share. But March 24th was our deadline for a t-shirt, so please register today. And I also wanted to make sure that everyone understood April 11th through the 13th, April 11th and 12th, that's a Thursday and a Friday night. So, and you can check the website for that, for the times, but just wanted to make sure everyone understood that it's not during the day on Thursday and Friday, because that may be keeping some people back who have to work, but it's the evening of 11th and 12th, and then Saturday day, that morning, we start around 9, 9.30, and it'll end around um, lunchtime. So, um, I want to steal something that Jimmy said about the worship. He said, had you engaged, it could have been better. And that just resonated with my heart. Ladies, when you engage, we need you to engage in, in the garden this year. It can't be all that it can be if you aren't present. Amen? So if you haven't registered, please register today. This indeed is going to be a weekend you do not want to miss. I hope to see you there. Thank you. Hear ye, hear ye. The official reading of the Megillah, the story of Esther, and the saving of the Israeli people will be read in the East Auditorium. So children of all ages, that's you too, Miss and Mr. We know who you're talking, yeah, right there. You may come to the East Auditorium now and enjoy the celebration and the reading of the story of Esther. All right. Yes, that's y'all's cue. There you go. All right, this morning we have a special treat. Um, we have a guest speaker who was actually brought up in this church from a young age, Miss Lindy. We are so happy that you're here this morning. Father, I just pray over Lindy. God, give her your truths to speak. And Father, I just pray that we receive your word from her this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's exciting to be here. It's exciting to do something different. Um, and yes, I have been part of this church for 38 years. So, um, and hopefully 38 more to go. Um, <laughs> and uh, I get to work with family. I get to be with family. And it's really, it's an honor. It's a joy and a privilege. And I really love it. I don't take it lightly um, that I get to do what I get to do. And uh, you can't 
asked me to speak without <laughs> allowing me to brag on the worship team for a few minutes because I never get the chance to do that and they are completely amazing. <laughs> yes. Um, every person that's a part of this team just has a heart to see the Lord do what he wants to do and that, a heart to just lay it down, um, our own agenda and there's no ego, there's no um, personal sort of gain that anybody's trying to get from anything, and it's just a beautiful thing to have a group of that many people whose heart is just so focused on the Lord. So if you don't know these people personally, <laughs> you should, because they have beautiful hearts. And um, so anyway, I just want to brag on the team, because they're, they're really amazing. I get to work with them all the time, and I'm really honored to do that. So I just wanted to mention that. And uh, I think it's funny, Ansley had picked a couple... Um, I don't know where you are. I'd picked a couple extra songs to sing at the end as just in case. And um, the next one was entitled Take Courage. That was the next song that was on the list to sing. And then Karen comes up here and, feel, <laughs> and says, I just feel like do we need to take courage. And um, so I think that's really a word for this morning. And some of what I want to touch on. So I'm, I'm talking about Esther this morning. You know, we're in the Feast of Purim. It began last night um, at sundown. And we'll continue through tonight at sundown. And um, I hope that you're familiar with the story of Esther and the, the general um, events and highlights of the story of Esther and how she, she came from being a common um, girl and in the land of Persia, and she was, she was plucked out of her environment and, and removed and went through this 12-month-long beauty process and put in, in the position of being queen of the land. And... Um, it's a beautiful story. It's, a, it's an interesting story because you never hear the, the name of God mentioned in the whole book. It's the only book of the Bible. You never hear the, the word God mentioned. And, um, but it really it highlights the fact that, that God is, is, is hidden, similarly as, as Esther was hidden in her Jewish this, um, in that role of being queen, she was hidden. So is God hidden, but he's working in all things. It's like you see his hand move in all things and all the events of the story, the moving around of people into different places. It's, it's filled with divine intervention and little God, like gotcha moments, you know, where he uh, twists things around in a good way and, and brings justice on multiple levels in different ways. And so you get to see him moving, you know, underneath everything in this hidden sort of way. And um, it's, it's, it's a really beautiful story. But um, it's so rich with layers, and there's so much that you could teach on the book of Esther. Um, I mean, the whole story takes place over a period of about 10 years, and you get this whole, you know, all these different dynamics. Um, but what I'm focusing on this morning, and what Pastor Tim asked me to kind of focus on this morning is this critical moment in Esther 4 where she is faced with this decision to go into the king or not. And um, just the, the wrestling and the warring of that because I think, you know, individually we live out that moment over and over and over again with the things that the Lord asks us to do and with the things that we do as followers of Jesus and his followers of the king, um, we live out that wrestle moment um, a lot in our life. I know I have. And, um, and we can learn from, the, um, from the, the ways that she walked that out in her life and then all the, all the amazing good consequences that followed because of her choice to obey and to do the really hard thing, to do the really unknown thing and to walk that out. So... Um, so, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you would like to open to Esther chapter 4. Um, I would really like to read the whole chapter. I know that's a little chunk of scripture, but I would like to read the whole chapter just so we can kind of get a good context for what's happening here and, and bring some different points out. So um, Esther chapter 4 verse 1 says, when Mordecai learned of everything that had been done, he's talking about the edict that was just um, released about destroying the Jewish people, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, 
And he went out into the midst of the city, and he wailed loudly and bitterly. And he came as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and mourning rites, and many had sackcloth and ashes spread out as a bed. Then Esther's attendants and her eunuchs came and informed her, and the queen was seized by great fear. And she sent garments to clothe the Mordecai so that he would remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. Then Esther summoned um, Hathak from the king's eunuchs, whom the king had appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this morning was and why it was happening. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the elimination of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict, which had been issued in Susa for their annihilation, so that he might show Esther and inform her, and to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and plead with him for her people. So Hatak came and reported Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and ordered him to reply to Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces, no, for any man or woman who comes to the king in the inner courtyard who is not summoned... He has only one law, that he be put to death, unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. And they reported Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai told them to to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants also will fast in the same way. And then I will go into the king, which is not in accordance with the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. So I just, I just want to break down, I guess, uh, this moment a little bit of what she's faced with um, as she's presented with her choices in this. Um, so, you know, as it says, the law of the land in that day was that anyone who came before the king, who entered un- uncalled for and unsummoned into the king's presence, was put to death at the whim of the king. He decided in that moment, however he was feeling, um, he decided in that moment if that person lived or died. And I just think it's really fascinating and almost slightly unbelievable that her, she's the queen. She is the, you know, she's supposed to be, oh, she is his spouse. She's supposed to be the queen of the land. Um, she has a, a high position and yet even she is not exempt from this law. <laughs> even the law, it, it applies to her, um, not just the peasant or not just the crazy person who wanders into the court or whatever. It applies to everyone, including the queen. And, um, and so, you know, through these scriptures, you see her remind Mordecai of this. Now, I, I doubt very much that Mordecai didn't know that that was the law of the land as he, you know, as he was part of the palace life and everything. I, I feel pretty certain he already knew that. Um, but she reminds him, <laughs> wait a minute, don't, don't forget, if I do this, He might kill me. I don't know how he's feeling, and he hasn't even asked for me for 30 days. And I just, you know, just reiterating to you, Mordecai, what um, what I'm risking here by doing this. Um, You know, and so Mordecai responds to her with this this iconic, you know, um, response of, don't imagine that you're going to be saved in this, and perhaps you've attained royalty for such a moment as this. And as I was kind of breaking down the scripture, it's like he does two different things with this. Um, he calls to the, the divine purpose that the Lord has that goes beyond just the ins and outs and, and the practical things of life. Um, if you look at the timeline of Esther, she's been queen for about four to five years by now. And that's enough time to kind of settle in to who you are now, which, okay, I'm no longer a common girl. I'm now the queen. And... I imagine you could kind of settle into a routine at that point, and well, here I am living my 
living my life um, as queen now, and and there's this, you know, there's this moment where Mordecai says, but maybe this is why you became queen. Maybe it's not to live in a palace. Maybe it's not to have all the fun, fancy things. Maybe there's a greater purpose to this. And he calls to that point in her of destiny and of divine um, intervention. And like I said, these little gotcha moments and these pieces that the Lord moves into place, um, he calls to that in her. And he also, the other thing he does, especially with the first half of that phrase, don't imagine that you will be saved. Um, it's almost like he exposes something that Esther might be believing that is not true. In that moment of risking something and in that moment of being nervous or afraid of going into the king, he exposes this, um, this lie that she might be believing of, if I don't do anything, if I don't move, if I stay where I'm at, I'll be safe. But if I do this, oh, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And, it, and that part was true. She could have died. But he says, hey, don't, don't imagine that you're going to stay safe. <laughs> this might feel safe right now in this moment, but don't imagine that you're going to stay safe because you're not exempt. You're not, you're not, um, you, you are part of the Jewish people. And it's like he exposes this thing that she could be believing that's just, that's untrue because she's in a state of, she's afraid, you know, as, as, as we all, as we all face and as we all um, deal with and the different things that we're called to walk out, the different hard things. Um, he reminds her that God will save his people because he's a God of covenant, because he's a God who, who is faithful and he's a God who, who will do what he says he's going to do. So if he made a covenant with the Jewish people, then somewhere from, from somebody somewhere, he will arise something, someone to, to save the Jewish people. But you will not stay safe. It is a lie to believe that you will stay safe if you do nothing. I have this um, little board in my closet that has a bunch of different, like, you know, just truths that I just need to remember. <laughs> and uh, one of the cards uh, in the middle in big bold letters says that fear is always based on a lie. <laughs> There's always something that, and I've just seen this to be true in my personal life, with big things and small things. There's always something that I'm believing that's just not true. And uh, in the midst of fear, when I'm feeling great fear, great panic, uncertainty, uh, you know, you just kind of get this little swirly, like, bleh, kind of like panicky thing. You don't know what to do. Um, and it prompts me, this little phrase always prompts me to dig a little bit deeper in my heart, dig a little bit deeper down and say, okay, what, <laughs> if I'm feeling afraid of this thing, what, what am I believing? What do I think is going to happen? Like, what am I believing is going to happen? Okay, let's say that horrible worst case scenario thing happens. Okay, then what? Okay, I dig to the next layer and dig to the next layer. What do I think is gonna happen here? Okay, so, and eventually you get down to this point where you're like, oh, yes, the Lord really does care about every detail of my life. Yes, he really will carry me through any sort of worst case scenario I could ever imagine. He really will hold me. He really will carry me through that thing. And when you hit that point of finding out what the lie is, it's like all of a sudden the fear just doesn't have that grip anymore. Because the truth has come and invaded that place. And it has taken away, it has exposed the lie of what I was believing. The truth comes, exposes the lie, and brings the freedom. That's what it says, right? His truth is what sets us free. And that's like this moment that you get to experience again and again as you press into these things of, ah, ah, I'm scared to do this because it's the hard thing because I'm afraid of what's going to happen. What if I, what if this happens? What if that happens? I don't know. I feel like the Lord is telling me to do this, but ah, I'm just scared. Well, dig deeper. What are you scared of? Okay. Why does that make you scared? Okay. What, just keep going until you hit the point where you find the lie. And then you ask the Lord to come and invade with his truth, remove that thing and get free. And go do what you're called to do. And sometimes you just have to do it afraid. You just do it. <laughs> and then you see the Lord come and do the thing that he does the best. And he will carry you through it. And he'll give you that courage. I mean, you look up what the, what a word, what the word lie means. And it's, you know, if you look in the, uh, in the Webster's, it says an untrue or inaccurate statement. Something that misleads it's something misleading. 
And it leads you to that place of paralysis, this place of bondage and panic and all these things that we're not created to live in. All these places that we weren't made for. It's not what you're made for. It's not where we're made to live. You experience that, and then you confront it, and you get out of it, and go live where the Lord's called you to live, which is freedom and peace. Um, And uh, I would say, like, I don't want to make a decision out of fear. Like, I don't want to make a decision because I'm afraid of something. And sometimes I succeed at that, and sometimes I fail at that. Um, But it's always the cry of my heart to to expose that and to make a decision that's not based on fear. And that can be tricky sometimes because fear can try and look like wisdom in something. And you really have to press into the heart of Jesus. Um, I mean, that's what I do. I press into the heart of Jesus. Lord, dissect this thing. And what is fear and what is wisdom? And then I also get counsel from people that I trust and people that I love and present the whole thing and, um, and get counsel. That's, I'm just telling you what I do to help dissect that thing because it can be real interwoven and, real, and, and it can feel tricky in the moment of deciding what is wisdom and what is fear. But just be aware of that, that sometimes fear tries to look like the smart thing to do or the wise thing to do, but if it's contrary to what God has actually asked you to do, then it's not wisdom. <laughs> it's not wisdom to do the opposite of what he asked you to do. Um, so that's why it's so critical to keep digging and finding this place of where the lie is. And that's just what hit me so hard with reading that scripture is that that's what Mordecai does to her. He reminds her of, hey, don't imagine You're imagining something that is not true in this scenario. You will not stay safe here. And exposes that and calls her with the second half of his statement, calls her to this place of divine um, destiny, bringing that to her memory. Because like I said, that could have gotten buried in the last five years of just living daily palace life and all the stuff with that. And with those two things, he calls her to a place where she's confronted with truth. And in that moment, she chooses the hard thing. She chooses to do it. And that I feel like it's so critical for us now, individually, I'm focusing this very individually as, as to the different battles and things that we face, but also beyond that, because um, all of our choices affect everybody around us, right? <laughs> it's never just about us. And, um, and in this moment, it is so critical that we are, we are motivated by truth and that we are motivated by a place or in a place of peace and have a determination to do what is said before us and a ter- determination to do the hard thing. Even if we feel like it's going to kill us, <laughs> we have to be determined to do the thing that the Lord has asked us to do. Um, And then um, I love if you look up the definition of truth, it says um, truth, but not merely truth as spoken. It's truth of idea, reality, sincerity, truth in the moral sphere, divine truth revealed to man, straightforward. Straightforwardness is the last word that makes up that definition. A lie, remember, the lie will mislead you, and the truth is straightforward. Um, I I mean, I talked a lot about the song Watchmen and about where I was in my life when I wrote that song, and um, and I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but um, but I can't not bring that up because when I think about this sort of scenario, that was one of the hardest things in my life to confront and to obey in because I really, 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 really didn't want to obey at all. And I wrestled with it for a long time. Um, I was in, uh, uh, we were in a relationship, I was in a relationship dating, and I felt like the Lord said this was my husband, I'm supposed to marry him. I'm like, great, desired my heart, yay, all worked out. Um, but it just, it wasn't working out, the timing wasn't. We, I, it, it, I mean, hindsight, I can see what was going on. There was the different layers that the Lord was working in our heart before he brought us to that point. Um, but... But it just wasn't working out, and and I and and after he tells me like, hey, this is your husband, yay, and then it's like, and I want you to walk away from it. I want you to end the relationship, walk away, end it, lay it down, and walk away. Not like take a break. Not like we did a fast. You know, we didn't talk to each other for forty days, and it was terrible. And um, uh, yeah, because I thought that would be easier. You know, right? Because at least we get back together after 40 days. You know, uh, this has got to be easier than totally ending the thing, but it was actually worse. And um, so we did get back together, and then it's just weird um, because 
uh, I knew the Lord said to walk away. And I mean, I wrestled with it for months. And um, a spoiler alert, we got married. And yes, <laughs> and he is, he is my husband, if you don't know the story. Um, but we had to come to a point where it was like, okay, something is just, it's like, there's nothing else to do here except what the Lord has asked us to do. And that is what filled my heart more than anything else was this great determination to do what he told me to do because I knew there was no better way. His way is the best way. There is no better way. And all of a sudden, it's like all the other options weren't an option. Like there's, like, there's no, I can't do this. And like, I can't go this way because he's not there. The only place he is, is in what he's called me to walk out. So that's all there is for me. So I'm going to do it. And I thought it would kill me. I, I mean, not literally, but I thought it would crush me. I didn't know, I didn't know how I would handle that. I didn't know. And, and I love, I'll just sidetrack here for a second. I love how the Lord writes our unique individual stories, right? <laughs> with, with what is, What's a challenge for me might not be a challenge for you. What's a challenge for you might not be a challenge for me. But, um, but he writes our unique individual stories because he knows our hearts so well. And he knows what it's going to take to lead us to this place um, where he wants us to be. And so, like I said, this is my story. Maybe it would be easy for you to break up, but it was not easy for me. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, but I was so filled with this desire, this overwhelming desire to do what the Lord had said in front of me, which was this hard, horrible thing. Um, but to do it well and to embrace the season that I was in, which is, you know, all the different things in my life that were happening at that time. And, and I, and I just said, okay, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to do it well. This is like in my flesh, in my soul, whatever. This is not what I want to do. I want to be planning a wedding, but I'm not, I'm doing this thing, but I'm going to do this well. And I'm going to trust you with the desire of my heart that I have no idea how I'm going to get back again <laughs> once I let this thing go. And, um, and so in that place, I, you know, I, I wrote this song about being a watchman because it was just so the cry of my heart to, to, to stand where I'm supposed to stand. And it still is, and I hope it is for all of us as a, as a, as a group, as a family, um, as followers of Jesus, it, it, the, the cry of our heart is to stand where he's called us to stand and say what he's called us to say and, and be still when he's called us to be still. Do what he's called you to do um, it, in, the hard, in the hard things and in the, and in the not so hard things. But, um, but it's just so funny that the thing that I thought would crush me, the thing I thought would kill me, ended up doing the complete opposite. And it exposed this peace of the Lord and this heart of the, the Lord, how he, he carried me through these emotions that I was so terrified of. He totally carried me through that. And he was for me what I never would have experienced in any other way. And it's become gold to me, and it's become a treasure to me that I think of often. All this stuff happened like 11 years ago, and I'm still talking about it like it was yesterday because it was so um, such a turning point in my life where um, where I, uh, you know I was able to finally <laughs> say yes and do the thing, and then watch the Lord be <laughs> above and beyond, you know, watch the Lord just totally carry, carry me. And I feel like every one of us in this room can share a story like that, where you've just seen the Lord do something that you were, uh, you were just totally unsure how the whole thing is going to work out, but then you see him come with who he is. And there is such a power, there's such a settling peace <laughs> in when you remember who you are, and when you walk in what you were created to walk in. And um, there's such a peace that comes with that that I feel like you can't hardly find anywhere else. <laughs> you can't find it anywhere else. It's only found in the Lord. And you find it as you, as you settle into who he is and into what he said and doing that thing that he's called you to do. Um, so I have two kids, and um, Shiloh is five and Eden is three. And... Um, I have lots of toys all over my house, and um, I also love order, and I also love organization, <laughs> and so I buy lots of baskets, right, because baskets can make your house look nice, <laughs> and you just dump all the toys in, and woo, the living room looks better, and um, so I have one really big basket that's kind of, um, you know, sort of that light brown wicker kind of stuff. And it holds a bunch of stuffed animals in our living room, but it's rather large. Um, anyway, and so, you know, kids are so funny because, like, everything in the whole wide world is um, uh, multifunctional to children. 
So it's a basket, and it's also a pony, and it's also a rocket ship, and it's also <laughs> whatever, a trampoline, and um, all these things. So, uh, so one day, <laughs> Shiloh has the basket on its side, and she's riding it like a pony. And of course, it's this like <laughs> wicker sort of wooden basket, like it's not, <laughs> it's not made for that. Um, so she's, she's like riding it like a horse. And I'm looking at the handle, and I'm seeing the handle's about to just completely break off of this basket. I'm like, Shiloh, I was like, stop it, stop it. I was like, you, you're putting stress on this part of the basket here because you're using it for something it wasn't designed for. I was like, I'm sorry, I'll be back. <laughs> like, it was like, it just, like, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what? Like, so this thing came out of my mouth that I had never thought of before. Um... Because I think we all experience stress, <laughs> you know, it's a very common human sort of problem. Um, and, and I have battled stress off and on since, I don't know, whatever, living in the, in the wild life of toddlerhood and, and running a business and, and, you know, being the worship leader and all the other amazing things I get to do in my life. Um, but it can, there's a temptation to fall into this place of being stressed out. Um, or being stressful because uh, you're not getting your own to-do list done or whatever it is. Um, and it just hit me as this phrase came out of my mouth of, okay, anytime, what if, what if any time that I'm experiencing stress, there is something in me that is doing something it was not designed to do? And I have been eating on that for a couple of months now because there is, there's still like daily temptation to be stressed out because I didn't get all the laundry done or I didn't empty the dishwasher and I didn't email somebody and whatever and I'm just stressed and overwhelmed by it. But yes, those things are good and yes, they need to be done, but there's a grace to do the things that he's called you to do in that day and not worry about the rest of it. And anytime you're worried about the things that he hasn't called you to do, you're functioning in a way that he hasn't designed you to function. And it will stress you out. <laughs> and stress is not good. <laughs> um, so much of that, a huge chunk of that is so mental. It's so emotional. It's, it's so internal. You know, there's so much of that that's an internal battle. Because um, like 90% of the time, I feel like you're, it doesn't even mean that your circumstances are going to change. <laughs> you might still be in the same stressful circumstance. Um, but it's all about your response. And it's all about your heart posture. It's all about your um, perspective. It's not, oh, this job is stressing me out. I need to quit. Quit this job. Well, did the Lord tell you to quit? <laughs> or is that where you're supposed to be, but your heart needs to change? Your perspective needs to change. Maybe you need to do what's in front of you and do it well. And not worry about all the other things that are in your heart. Because the Lord knows they're there anyway. And you can trust him to lead you in those, into those places. Um, we have a book that we carry in the bookstore called Rooted, and it's by um, Banning Liebscher. He's the director of Jesus Culture. And it's required reading if you join the worship team. It has nothing to do with worship. It all has to do with embracing the process that the Lord has started and will finish in your life and trusting him in the waiting seasons when you want to be doing oh, X, Y, Z thing that maybe the Lord put in your heart, but you're over here doing ABC thing that is really boring and mundane and not whatever. It's trusting him in that place of waiting and in the small steps that he orchestrates to get you to the X, Y, Z. I highly recommend it. <laughs> if you want a good read, um, just be ready to get your heart um, changed. But, um, but it's, it's uh, just a great reminder to embrace the process, trust the Lord in it with everything that's in you, and to do what he's put in front of you and to do that well. Um, I guarantee you will find greater peace in walking out the thing that the Lord has set before you that you think might kill you. <laughs> You're going to find greater peace in that than you will ever find in your place of temporary comfort. You're going to find greater peace walking out what he's called you and, and created you for, what he's designed you for. There's going to be greater peace in that than there would ever be in the temporary comfort of staying put and not doing anything out of fear. Esther, I mean, that, that's, that's what happened, I guess, a piece of what happened. I mean, obviously, I don't know, but um, she found greater peace in the saying yes 
and she's it, it, to her, and it, all of a sudden it's like, okay, this is the only way. This is what I'm going to do. And she called the fast, but when she's calling the fast and asking everybody to fast for her, it's not so that she can make a decision. She already made the decision. She said, I'll go into the king, and if I perish, I perish. She made it in that moment before those three days ever happened. Um, so there's, there's just a point where, you, where you're faced with that. And again, it's like everything else falls away, and you're faced with this moment of, of where you do the hard thing. Um, and I think it's interesting that, you know, her situation didn't change, like, in the sense, in that moment, I mean. Like, so the law of the land didn't change. It's not like, oh, all of a sudden, oh, yay, the king called for me. Phew, I don't have to risk my life. Yay. Or the law changed. Yeah, anybody can go now. That's wonderful. Um, that circumstance didn't change. The law remained. She still could have been killed. All that stayed the same. The only thing that changed was her internal posture, her internal perspective, her determination to do it anyway. And when she did it anyway, that's what changed the external circumstance, the external situation. All of a sudden, things started moving. And hey, come to a banquet. Hey, come to another banquet. Okay, this is what's happening. What? I can't believe this. I'm going to decree a second edict. And things started changing. And all of a sudden, everything turned around. And Haman is hung on these gallows that he has for Mordecai. And uh, another decree is, is released so the Jews can defend themselves. And this festival is created. And, and the nation is saved. But what happened before that external situation changed was the internal situation that changed. The internal perspective changed. And then that's what moved everything on the outside. Um, because your very personal moment, your very internal personal moment of decision can carry a whole nation with you. I mean, this is exactly what happened. Her very personal internal moment to risk her own personal individual life, that very hard decision, it carried a whole nation of people with her. And whether your nation looks like the three people that live in your house, whether it looks like your neighborhood, whether it looks like a city, whether it looks like a state, uh, maybe it is our nation. Whatever, whatever that looks like, whoever you're an influence over, just remember that that very internal, individual, personal, alone time decision can bring all those people with you. It's a truth that we talk about, and I talk about it all the time, because it's just so healthy to remember that it's never just about you. Um, and just as a side note, just as I, I'm closing, closing here, um, I, I just want to point out just the beautiful truth of how different this ancient king of Persia functioned with how our king Jesus functions. It's just so interesting. There's such a contrast between the way this king functioned in his court and with his people, with his bride. She was terrified to come and talk to him. He hadn't even wanted her for a month. How opposite is that from the way our king functions? How opposite is that from the way our king um, interacts with us? Think of the unbelievable high price that he paid so that we could have access. Now, he longs for it. He wants you to come to him. So in the hard thing and in the thing that, is, that you're wrestling with so much, don't be afraid to go into his court. Run into his court. It says that we can boldly come before his throne. There is no fear like she experienced of, of uh, I don't know if God will want me. There, isn't, there shouldn't be any of that. That's a lie. That's an untruth. And maybe it's misleading you to a wrong place. <laughs> The truth that will take you straight to the heart of God is that he wants you, is that he longs for you. He longs for humanity, and he has created and, and uh, orchestrated this beautiful um, way to come to him through his own son, through the price that he paid, through all that he did so that we, um, so that we can come into his presence and we can live in the place that we are created to live in. This is what you were made for. It's what you were designed for. It's the longing of his heart. He longs for relationship and he longs to abide with us. Um, 
And there's a month in the Hebrew calendar called the month of Elul, and uh, it's usually late summer, early fall time. And I just love this month so much because it's the month where the king is in the field. And it's such a beautiful phrase, it's such a poetic phrase to, um, to wrap up such a beautiful truth that, that there's this, this um, tradition, I guess, um, where the king um, of the land would leave for one month out of the year, he would leave his royal palace and he would leave all the protocols, he would leave all that and he would set up camp in the field. He would set up camp amongst the peasants and amongst the common people of the land, and there would be direct access to the king for that month of the year. And I just want to encourage you this morning that your king is in the field, that he's close to your heart. And in the midst of everything, he comes to the peasant as they're working, as they're doing the thing that they're called to do. He comes to the peasant, and he is right there And all of a sudden, this peasant has greater access to the king than someone who works and lives in the court the other, you know, uh, times of the year. And I just want to encourage you that your king is like that. He's the king that comes to the field. He comes to where you are. And that has been such a personal encouragement to me in this season of crazy busy and in the season of my life looking so different than it did 10 years ago when I didn't have toddlers and a family and a business and all this other stuff that um, I, I just practically, I just don't have two hours every single day to just lay on my face. I have to feed my kids. I have to get them in the bathtub. I have to get them in the, I have to do the laundry so they have clothes to wear. Like there's the things that you have to do to walk out the things that the Lord's called you to walk out. But in all that, He comes to where you are. He comes to you in the midst of your workings and in the midst of walking out the thing that he's called you to walk out. Yes, of course, there's seasons where you steal away and where you you pause all that to spend face-to-face time, of course. But there's also a part where the Lord comes to you in your field. Isn't that what Jesus did when he came to earth? He came to the field to dwell amongst his people, to provide that access and to make a way so that everyone thereafter could have the same level of access to his heart. It's such a beautiful truth that confronts one of the main lies that we all face, which is you're all alone. In whatever you're dealing with, no one has ever dealt with this before. No one's going to understand you. This is the weirdest thing. This is crazy. Don't tell anybody because you're all by yourself. You've got to figure this out. All those things are lies, 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 lies. And the nature of God's heart directly confronts that by saying, I am a king who comes to you where you are, and I long to dwell with you where you are. He wants you to approach him. He wants you to come. Um, And we still, as a nation, as a people, as um, the bride of Christ, as as the bride of the king, we still come before the king on behalf of a nation, right? Because, as in the story of Esther, the king was the only one who could save the nation. Similarly, in our story, the king is the only one who can save the nation. So we still have this same mandate and this same, um, this same requirement to come before me. He says, come before me on behalf of your nation. He, we, he's a king. He's a king who wants us to come. He still requires our obedience. He requires our yes to the hard thing. But his way brings life, not death. He, he, he requires everything. He requires your whole heart. He requires you to lay it all down. But that way leads to life. It doesn't lead to death. And he can take that fear that's in your heart and replace it with truth and with courage. That's where I wanted to end today. Is this, this exchange, this great exchange that he has um, always promised us that he will take that fear and exchange it for courage. And we, uh, we have a clarity of vision. There's a clarity that comes. As with Esther, there's this clarity that came of, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I might die. What, I, this is not going to work. What's going on? Um, there's this clarity that came of, okay, this is what we're going to do. You're going to fast for three days. I'm going to fast for three days. And I will go into the king. And if I perish, I perish. She decided in that moment, right then, this is what I'm going to do. And she walked it out, and it changed a nation. So um, I just encourage you, as you're in these places in your life um, where you're, maybe you're dealing with the hard thing, maybe, maybe you're not, 
but we probably all will at some point, um, as, you're, as you're wrestling with that hard thing, let the truth of who the Lord is just wash over you in that place to expose the lies, to, um, to let his truth come and invade those points and bring that peace and that clarity that nothing else can bring. <laughs> nothing else. Temporary safety does not bring that peace. Um, only being in his will and in who he is. So I just want to pray over y'all if that's okay. Emily, do you mind coming and playing? Um, and, um, oh, and can the communion team go ahead and come? Y'all are welcome to come get set up to do communion. Um, but I just want to pray over you um, just as I close this morning, if that's okay. Um, Lord, we just thank you for your presence, God. We thank you for the access that you have provided, for the access that you um, laid before us, for the great high price that you paid. the great high price that you paid so that we could come. And Lord, we just say the cry of our heart this morning and forever is to, is to say yes to you, yes to the hard thing, yes to the thing that we think will crush us and walk that out and watch you come and do what only you can do. And Lord, I just ask this morning, any place where we are struggling with the fear, struggling with the lies, struggling with the, the misleading inaccuracy, God, of, of, of a thought process in our mind, God, I ask that you would come this morning and that you would come and shift and rearrange and shatter and invade with your truth, God, that you would come and settle your truth in our heart, that it would be all that we see and the only way before us. We want to be a people who live our life, God, on our face before you, who live our life with the determination to walk out the thing that you've called us to walk out. To walk out the things that feel scary in the moment, but that bring life in the end, that bring joy in the end, because your way is the best way. Your way is the better way. Your way is the better way. There's nobody like you, God. So we just say yes this morning, God, as a people and as, um, as, a, as a family, as a, as a church, God, we just say yes to you this morning, yes. Just encourage you, just say it out of your mouth, yes. We say yes to you, God. Yes to your way, yes to what we understand and yes to what we don't understand. Yes to what is known and yes to what is unknown, God. In our human state of imperfection, God, in our humanity, God, we want to come with a heart that just says yes to the fullness of our ability. We want to say yes with everything that we have and everything that we are. Yes to your way. Trusting your heart in the process, trusting your, your hand hidden in all things and working in all things. We trust your hand. We trust your heart, Jesus, because you are good and you are good all the time and you finish what you begin. You don't leave us hanging in the middle, but you finish what you begin on your timetable and in your timeline. So God, we love you. We do say yes to your way, Jesus. Come and invade us again in another level um, in the fullness of who you are. We love you. God, we praise you in Jesus' name. of worship in this place and bring your tithes and offerings and come and receive uh, the communion. I ask Lindy to go ahead and sing this song.
standing come Father, we just thank you today for the grace to take courage, to take courage. We thank you for the grace right now, for the steadfastness of our souls right now, Lord, while we're in the waiting. Father, we today take hold onto your hope. And Lord, with eyes, with the spirit eyes that you've given us, we watch for your triumph to unfold. And we remember, Jesus, the great price that you paid as you laid your life down willingly and you overcame. And we, we just today, as we remember and take your body, 
this picture right here, the symbol of your body. We remember that the battle has been won and the victory is yours. The victory is yours. Everyone in this room right now, he is your victory. He is the victorious one. Take courage. Receive this bread. Receive his body as your healing and as your hope. For he is your anchor and he shall sustain you as you hold on to him. Go ahead and receive. As Lindy spoke and she dealt with the fear and she addressed the lie that would that will lead us astray, but yet the truth will keep us steadfast. That is part of the word that the Lord has been speaking to us in this hour, how he is unwinding these things so that we can get back on the path. And just as that ship that's going in the storm and we stop and he's holstering us up, he is binding us up. Remember that as Lindy spoke to allow yourself to go into these places to allow the Lord to establish his truth in you, in us. So, Father, we thank you again for sending your Son, sending us a way back, sending us a way you extended your scepter to us by providing your Son as the sacrifice so that we could come to you, so that we could come back to you. Jesus, we thank you for being the way the truth, the life, that we could be reconciled back. We thank you for the blood that was shed so that we might have life and have it more abundant. We thank you and we do this, we take this in remembrance of you. Was that good? Was that good? We thank you, Lindy. Thank you for pouring into us today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We're so thankful that you came. And those that are guests, thank you for coming. We appreciate you coming and spending time with us. And uh, introduce yourself to someone. Someone hopefully will introduce themselves to you. We love to have you back again. Everyone be blessed. Remember Pastor Tim, Susan, Isaac, Paul, John, and Scott as they're coming back. Pray for them, and we'll see you guys on Wednesday night.